Has this ever happened to you? Wow, magic in this game is so cool! I can throw fireballs, ice balls, summon shields, summon people... <laughs> I, I'm going to be the best mage! I'm going to make them all bow down to me! One Skyrim later. <sighs> well, let's talk about Dragon's Dogma, also known as that one game I saw a video of where magic doesn't actually suck. With Dragon's Dogma 2 being right around the corner, I thought this was a good time to get back to the original, get all the trophies and ask, was Dragon's Dogma actually good? Now, look, I know that this title may invoke some sentiment, I mean this game is considered a cult classic, but I've been pretty detached from this game, I didn't get to play it back when it was first released, and years later when I gave it a try, I kinda gave up because I found out you can fail quests, and I wanted to do all of them. But now, I have returned with its platinum trophy, which scientifically speaking makes me part of the 1.6% of people whose opinion on this game actually matters. Jokes aside, this is the structure of the video, and in case the chapters don't work, which usually happens on my videos, you can also find these timestamps in the description. So, gather your pawns, grab a moldy apple, a thick flask of water, hit that subscribe button, because it helps, and let's fairy stone right into it. Part 1. Magic doesn't suck. If you are like me, what got you looking at this game is just getting a glimpse of the spells you're able to cast. Because as a mage enjoyer, I absolutely loved what I saw. Now things start off pretty basic with fire, ice, lightning related stuff and some utility spells. But what is great is the fact that these spells from the get go actually have some personality to them. What do I mean by this? How can spells have personalities, you might ask? Well, I made a joke about Skyrim at the start, so let's see how Skyrim does it. Spells in Skyrim are also separated per elemental type, as both games have a system of resistances and weaknesses. But when it comes down to it, you have a lot of spells that work the same. You can throw a fireball, or an ice ball, or a bolt of lightning, and yes, I know that the last one is technically visually different, but the idea is the same. Or you also have spells that throw fire, ice, and lightning, again, different elements, but functionally the same spell. This is where Dragon's Dogma is much better. Whatever spell or element you use, everything works differently, not just visually, but also functionally. The basic fire spell sends a fireball that explodes in a small radius, the ice spell channels a damaging AoE around you, thunder sends lightning bolts and can hit several enemies at once. And when we get to the more advanced stuff, it only gets better, you can make fire erupt from the ground, get a lightning whip, this is what I mean, there's genuine uniqueness to these spells. Hell, you can even imbue basic attacks with elements power which causes your attacks as a mage or sorcerer to behave differently. And it doesn't even stop there, because Dragon's Dogma doesn't just make spells unique, but also goes out of its way to make you feel powerful. As a sorcerer, the later stuff you get aren't really spells as much as they're just natural f***ing disasters. Call down meteors from the sky, conjure devastating cyclones, shake the very earth itself. This, right here, is the mage fantasy I've been looking for. An experience designed from the ground up to make you feel great as a magic user. And as much as it pains me to say it, it does eventually get awful. Here's the thing, these spells take time to cast. I mean, of course, you do have to do your little incantation rather than just spam them. But eventually, they start taking too long, especially when you get upgraded versions of these spells as you have to sort of overcast them, which takes more time. Let's take the Maelstrom spell as an example. The basic version takes 11 seconds to cast, and advanced, it's 17, which I know doesn't sound like much, but this is the first time I actually looked up the precise cast time, and trust me, it feels like an eternity when you're playing. Uber Eats is faster than this. Even when using an augment to reduce that cast time, it reduces it by the most 2 seconds, but the cast time alone may not seem that bad. The problem is that you can be interrupted, which leads to the entire cast progress being reset, and a lot of stuff can interrupt you, from basic attacks to just simple gusts of wind. There is an augment that also makes you harder to interrupt while you cast, but honestly, I've noticed no difference at all. So, despite the game making you feel powerful, it also forces you to exploit terrain, hide behind stuff, and even try to cheese things, like casting in places where nothing can touch you. Essentially, the best playstyle there is to using these spells is to just play completely passively. You cannot play reactively because of how long some spells take to cast. Like, if a monster becomes vulnerable, by the time you're able to cast your spell, they're probably already back up. For 
Furthermore, spells render you immobile or let you move really slowly, so if you know a spell won't hit an enemy because of where you are, repositioning is often kinda difficult. Or if you want to get out of the way of an attack, you have to let go or get hit, so you reset either way, that's how helpless you are. And it does get worse, because for whatever reason, the cast time bar here is not actually accurate. You see, aside from this cast time, you also have a small animation that, if interrupted, also resets your progress without actually casting the spell. It's the sort of stuff that feels really unfair, and it's purely a problem of poor design. I think the game could have done much better in this respect, ways to cast things faster during your channeling, or at least have the progress regress slowly rather than just resetting it. Also, that additional animation should just not be there. The game should include it in your cast time and communicate it clearly. These factors are probably the biggest reason I did not end up enjoying being a sorcerer as much as I wish I did. But there's one more big reason, so let's go to the next part too, Colossus SS. As a medieval fantasy game, the classes, or vocations as the game calls them, are to some extent what you'd expect. You have a close combat option as a fighter, a hybrid of close and range combat as a strider, and the mage which we've already talked about. These three are the basic vocations, and I'm saying basic because there are three advanced versions of those vocations. A two-handed warrior with extremely powerful offensive capabilities, a ranger that uses a more powerful type of bow, or a sorcerer that just straight up conjures the end of the world. And even though these classes are quote unquote advanced, it doesn't necessarily mean better. Going from fighter to warrior takes away your shield, so you can't play as defensively or use skills to taunt enemies. Sorcerers may get access to devastating magic, but they lose their healing and purifying abilities. It's not really about becoming something better, but rather something different, and I think that's great because this system makes no class truly irrelevant or inferior. Like, I might have been a sorcerer, but I always wanted a mage besides me for heals. But what I think is even cooler is that there's three additional hybrid vocations based on combinations of basic classes. The Mystic Knight, for example, is a combination between a mage and a fighter. Because of that, they are rather flexible, being able to equip a mace and a shield or even use a staff to cast magic. And this is not to say that their skills are just copies from other classes, they bring unique things to the table. Like being able to infuse your shield with elemental magic, which damages enemies when you block their attacks. Stop hitting yourself! No matter how you look at it, the classes of Dragon's Dogma might look rather basic and standard for the genre, but they bring an amazing amount of variety to its gameplay. Even though Sorcerer are undoubtedly visually really cool and powerful, the other vocations also have a lot of things going for them. In the end, I didn't get to use most of them, but whatever I decided to use was viable, fun and unique. Anyway, here's the bit of the video where things turn sour. While the game gives you a lot of freedom of choice with these vocations, there are quite a few moments where Dragon's Dogma simply disregards that, and it's absolutely trashic. Let's talk about the Witchwoods. This is an optional area covered in fog that can be dispelled by destroying talismans, some of which are a bit high up and otherwise inaccessible to melee vocations. So even as a magic class, unless you have a spell that somehow reaches high up, you won't be able to touch them. This aiming issue was especially compounded when facing golems because they're unique. You can only damage them by targeting their sigils, and as a sorcerer or mage you can only target them by moving the camera around, which as you can see from the footage is pretty unreliable. But what is worse is a nearby golem that is unique in the sense that the sigils are not on its body, instead they're spread out throughout the area. For whatever reason, these sigils cannot be damaged by magic, which wouldn't sound so bad if you could instruct your pawns to destroy them, and unfortunately you can't really do that. If you're lucky, they may attack them on their own, but if a sigil is placed higher up, then you can't really do anything about it. The game essentially forced me to change my vocation to complete this side quest, and honestly, it was a painful thing to experience. For the game to offer you such freedom and varied vocation classes only to have bits and pieces of its content completely disregard that was just... Uh, overwhelmingly disappointing. This also happens in the Dark Arisen expansion, with bosses where ideally you'd be a strider. Otherwise, for a boss like this, you'd have to wait for a specific attack to have any chance to reply. In fact, this entire expansion felt painful to play as a sorcerer, with enemies caked up in health, being able to interrupt you with ease. I essentially cheesed as much of it as I could. And even then, the final boss was an absolute pain, and the only time I had lowered the difficulty to easy. Honestly, it's quite ironic how I joked about Skyrim making itself options so aggressively good, only for Dragon's Dogma to make magic feel frustratingly hard to use. I genuinely ended up regretting my choice to play as a sorcerer. It was honestly sad to see how fantastic magic is, only for the game's design to shoot it down so viciously. So I've grazed the subject of pawns just a bit, so let's move on to part 3. Pawns. Pawns are, I'd say, the most unique thing to Dragon's Dogma's gameplay formula. 
You as an Arisen are able to create your own personal pawn, and you get to decide their vocation, equipment, and behavior in battle. But what's cool is that this pawn functionality is actually an online feature. You can have up to two additional pawns in your party, and pretty much every pawn you encounter is another player's creation, a representation of what they desire in a battle partner, or in my case, just a partner. Now, some of you may shout and scream about how I took the character creation seriously rather than making something ridiculous. The thing is that if I'm given the option to create a beast of a man, I'll create a beast of a man. <laughs> Go fuck me, I'm born. Jokes aside, these pawns are pretty useful, and I'm not saying this only combat-wise. Throughout your adventure, they have things to say, tips on how to complete quests, info about the general area, warn you of enemies you may have not taken note of, and their elemental weaknesses and strengths. But here's something really neat, by default, pawns don't really know things. The entire adventure is a learning experience for them, and you can also find scrolls to teach them about stuff. Now, I'll be honest, I haven't really paid attention to how their behavior changes once they learn things. I mean, look, I'm a gay man who'll be in his 30s in a few years. I'm very much about me now. But much like you can summon other people's pawns, other people can summon yours. And this happens to be a somewhat social feature. When someone uses your pawn, you don't just get a reward, but they also evaluate your pawn based on various things like usefulness. So, all in all, I think this is a really cool, unique online feature. But what I really appreciate is the fact that these servers have been upkept to preserve online functionality for more than a decade. Out of every single platform, only the servers for the old Xbox 360 have been shut down, and that's pretty impressive. You can bet that if this were a Ubisoft game, the servers would have been shut down by now. And this is not to say that the experience of Dragon's Dogma would be broken without it, since there are plenty of offline pawns you could use either way, but I appreciate it still. So now that I've said what I like about pawns, it's that part of the video where I talk about what I didn't like. Let's focus on pawn and enemy behavior during gameplay, which actually played a significant role in my annoyance with playing as a sorcerer. The idea is that as a sorcerer you want pawns to pick up the aggro so you can cast your spells in peace. But even early on I had problems with that because sometimes enemies just do weird shit. Like they charge through the group to you as if to attack you but then they just go somewhere else or they reposition themselves weirdly. Their pathing is really messed up for some reason, they don't follow a logic. But aside from that, I always wanted to have at least one fighter because they have an ability that aggroes everything around them. For a sorcerer, that sounds great. Except that it doesn't really work and I never understood why. I don't know if it's a distance issue, I don't know if it has to be used frequently because it may have a low duration, or if it just simply doesn't work. But you can imagine that as a sorcerer that takes about 10,000 years to cast something, this can be mighty frustrating. And my grievances don't stop there because pawns also do some weird and inconsistent things. For example, in combat they tend not to stray too far from you. So rather than keep enemy aggro at a distance, they tend to return to you and put your channeling progress at risk. But then there are also moments when you want them to obey your command, like in this DLC here. I was spamming the come command and they would just take their sweet time. And since we're talking about this annoying boss here, let me highlight another problem. As I said before, ideally, a strider would be able to make short work of this boss by targeting its eye, since that's where it's vulnerable. Attacking it anywhere else won't deal any damage to it. Another way to make it vulnerable, briefly, is to wait for this attack where tentacles are up from the ground. The idea is that you can go under the boss and it will damage itself, but the problem is that it can also target pawns and they have no idea what to do. You essentially lose an opportunity to counteract through no real fault of your own. Going into Dragon's Dogma 2, I really hope there's some improvement to these things, because they're a sour note to a system that is pretty engaging to interact with. Now, I've talked quite a bit about gameplay related stuff, so for now I want to switch the discussion towards the world of Dragon's Dogma as a setting, because I believe this to be one of the weakest aspects of the game. Part 4, Grancis. So, the game takes part in the continent of Grancis, a very faithful representation of a medieval fantasy land. You've got goblins, lizard people, ruins, castles, cities, etc. But the problem is that the world doesn't have an identity, something that makes me think, oh yeah, that's typical Dragon's Dogma. Let's go back to Skyrim for a second. Let's say you're traveling around and all of a sudden you're stopped by the Elmeri Fashion Police. They want to take away your Talus necklace because it's ugly. You get the idea, that's a thing that immediately makes you think, oh, that's Skyrim. Or something like this. A new hand touches the beacon. 
Dragon's Dogma doesn't really have something comparable to that, and they could have really taken a note from Bethesda's games. I mean, the game director himself points out that some of their games are quite similar to what they wanted to make. The inspiration to adapt these random encounters or even try doing something based on them was there. Instead, the overworld of Grancis is just populated by random monsters and kind of nothing else. In that regard, it feels shockingly empty despite being much smaller compared to the scale of larger open world maps, which are otherwise at a much larger risk of feeling empty. Other than that, visually, Dragon's Dogma may be a faithful representation of a medieval fantasy world, but its lack of identity is made even more palpable by having places that really have no unique characteristic or feel. Casardis is just a fishing village, Grand Soren is the vague idea of a capital city slap banged in the middle of the continent, and then there's some ruined castles or caverns that don't really carry much importance. And I know Skyrim also has that sort of stuff, but Whiterun is not just a city at the heart of Skyrim, it's also a castle created to capture dragons. Riften is not just a grimy city, it's full of corruption and home to a complex sewage system where a predominant faction of thieves hide. Markarth is a heavily industrialized mining city and home to a conflict between its native people and a wealthy faction. <laughs> Even visually, locations are set apart. Windhelm looks decrepit and cold, both literally and metaphorically. Solitude's castle is on a massive cliff. Winterhold's college has its old dilapidated stone bridge connecting it to the village. These pieces of scenery are simply sky-rimmed into my mind. Wait, why did I make that joke? Meanwhile, Grand Soren is just, yeah, a medieval city looking pretty much what you'd expect a medieval city to look like. And you might say that it's an unfair comparison, but both games came out within a year of each other. There's nothing really special to say about Grancis, something that conveys any sort of identity. At most, you have the Everfall, which is relevant only once early on and becomes important at the end. And to be completely honest, and spoiler alert, when the Everfall collapses and becomes this nexus of weird dungeons and powerful creatures, it actually does manage to become memorable. It's really cool how you loop through it, and exploration-wise it's great and very unique compared to how you navigate the rest of the world. It even has a unique online boss that keeps track of how much damage every player deals in their world. Again, an online feature that still works more than a decade after the original release. PlayStation 3 players will have soon managed, or maybe even have already managed, to defeat it more than 3000 times. The Everfall stands in solidarity as the most unique place in the entirety of this game. Everything else though? Just really, really forgettable. Like, in a few years, if you'd show me this map, I'd probably even forget it's from Dragon's Dogma because that's how much it lacks an identity. Now before we move on, I also want to touch upon actually traveling within the world of Grancis. I know that the idea of fast travel is pretty much a parody at this point. I mean, are you really a video game if I cannot fast travel instantly with no hindrances whatsoever? I think gamers like myself yearn for the sort of game where fast travel might be available, but you'd rather have the world be so beautiful and full of potential adventure and interactions that you just choose not to. Well, Dragon's Dogma is somewhat unique in this discussion. Not because because you wouldn't want to fast travel, but because fast traveling is really limited. There are essentially two components to fast traveling. The first are port crystals, of which there are two, one in Casardis and one in Grand Soren. These are the only spots you can teleport to, and if you want more, you'll have to find them and place them yourself around the world. Then there are fairy stones, consumables used to actually teleport to the port crystals. It's very clear that by design, fast traveling is meant to be very limited, but as we've discussed, there's no interesting interactions or things to experience as you walk, just random enemies to keep you preoccupied. You will eventually really want to fast travel. Here's an anecdote. There's this bandit camp here and when you arrive you find out that there are a group of women led by a misandrist. She actually has a side quest for you which you have to do for the hero trophy, but she won't talk to you if anyone in the group is male. So what you have to do is go back to Grand Soren, buy one set of ladies garb for every male in the group and then go back. In total, if you wouldn't fast travel you'd have to make the long trek there twice four times if you count going back to Grand Soren. The moment I found out that there's an eternal fairy stone that is given to you freely for having the Dark Arisen version of the game, I swiftly made ample use of it, because the game's sensational concept of walk to place got boring really early on. One thing I will say that the game does right is that the knight is actually a knight. Which I know sounds a bit stupid, but when I played Skyrim ages ago, I always had a mod that made knights darker, just so that they're an actual hindrance to your travels. I wanted to be immersed and give candlelight an actual use. Dragon's Dogma actually does this seamlessly. Whether it's night or you're inside of a cave, you actually need a lit lantern to see what's going on, so at least there's that positive silver lining to the world of Grancis. Now, since we've talked about how the world of Dragon's Dogma lacks any real identity, let's also talk about the lack of Part 5 character. 
Dragon's Dogma has probably some of the most underwhelming characterization I've seen in a video game in a while. Most characters here simply don't have an actual character, which I guess you could argue makes sense, it's hard to give a significant personality to more than 100 NPCs. Weirdly enough, the pawns actually do have personality despite the game specifically making them characters that have no real identity or backstory. You can sit down with your pawn, discuss tactics, and even the type of personality they should display. I chose mine to be aggressive because he's a top. But when it comes to the few characters that have some semblance of personality, their character is hard to notice, bland, and one-dimensional. Kina's sole character trait is trying to help you. Alienor is a typical damsel in distress. And, uh, who else has a forgettable and remarkable character? Oh wait, I can't remember, and that's kind of the point. At most, only a few handpicked characters receive the luxury of having a deeper character for a maximum of one minute each. And that's it, that's all the game does. And the sad part is that these moments are actually really good. Mercedes is the head of a military corp and it's hinted that she feels ignored and not taken seriously. And it all comes to a head when she has to confront the treacherous Julian. She is mocked and confronted by the idea that her homeland sent her to Grancis not because of her military prowess, but rather in a simple political political act to maintain the relationships between the two countries. She requests the Arisen to duel Julian alone to regain her honor, and you can choose to stand aside or intervene. Either way, she survives and is distraught because she could not win, but promises to the Arisen to return to her homeland and come back with aid against the dragon. It's kind of a beautiful one minute piece about her coming to accept her weakness and strengthen her resolve. Then there's also Julian, who the game uses to hint at the tension between nations. He desires to sabotage Grancis in its efforts of stopping the dragon, as the king besting a second one would undoubtedly make his nation look like the strongest above all. And this quest can actually go one of three ways. If you don't intervene, Mercedes loses and Julian leaves, but if you do, he dies. And then, the third outcome is that you can bring Julian back to life via rare item. In doing so, he is quite dignified and acknowledges you, choosing on his own to turn himself in and remain imprisoned. You can actually even go and talk to him and he'll give you his own shield. Wait, why is he allowed to keep it in prison though? Then there's Celine, the girl in the woods who people believe to be a witch. In her side quest, you find out that she's not actually human, she's a pawn to an arisen who completed her quest ages past. And the game highlights her struggle to be on her own, being unable to make her own decisions. But here, in talking to the ghost of her arisen, you get to know of an important piece of logic to this world, the bestowal of spirit, a process whereby a pawn becomes more and more like their master. Celine is actually in the process of becoming human, which is something she actually wants. She goes from someone who doesn't really know what it means to live, to to someone who, by the end of the game, is proud to stand along you as an equal, having become fully human. All of this stuff is great, but they are mere minutes of character interactions in a game that has hours. One more thing that the game tries to do is an affinity system whereby your actions influence the attitude people have around you. Essentially, stuff like hitting them bad, and stuff like gifting and completing quests, good. Weirdly, there's no consequence from stealing from them. It's a system that I've pretty much ignored completely since early on I kept throwing stuff at people and nothing bad would really happen. In fact, there's this one side quest that is just etched in my mind. Eleanor, the duke's wife, asks you to join her in her chamber because she fears for her life, and indeed, the duke shortly follows and tries to kill her. If if you choose to intervene, the duke snaps out of it and imprisons you, and a while later, Eleanor breaks you out to repay you for saving her. After this, you'd expect some characters to react to you negatively because their affinity towards you will have likely been changed for the worse. But no, you can talk to the duke and other NPCs like nothing happened. This doesn't just show a lack of detail to this affinity system, but also to character interactions as a whole. But the culmination of this affinity system affects what happens at the end of the game. So, spoilers ahead. When you finally get to confront the dragon, plot twist, he has more of a personality than anyone else. Jokes aside, the real plot twist is that he kidnaps the character with the highest affinity towards you and offers you a choice. Either walk away, sacrificing them but returning as a fake hero who's believed to have slain the dragon, taking over Grand Soren and living eternally due to the absence of a heart, or fight the dragon to save that character and win back your heart. Now, as a plot twist, I think this is pretty good. It explains why you meet several Arisen who have not aged, or why the Duke is mad. He's essentially stolen valor, and he has an internal conflict. He's succumbing to madness because of his choice while also wanting to remain in his position of power. It's great as a piece of narrative and characterization. My problem though is with what the wiki calls the beloved, so I'm gonna use that term rather than saying Max Affinity character. How this character gets selected seems very arbitrary, and honestly kind of lazy. In my first playthrough, since I did every side quest, I ended up with Eleanor, which makes sense since she had a spicy scene. I mean, come on, you know writers around that time didn't know what to do with women anyway. Now this works, sort of? I did give another character an item that is supposed to bind us together, but 
who cares? Look, I'll be honest, most of these characters don't have an actual character. The emotional impact this cutscene is supposed to have was ruined either way. But in the next playthrough, something interesting happened. I somehow maxed my affinity with Eleanor just by talking to her, and in the finale she still shows up even though I did not do her side quest. She's supposed to be dead! Then, in my final playthrough, I decided to try and see if literally anyone could appear here, so I raised my affinity with this horrid little twat. And yet, somehow, Mercedes showed up even though I didn't talk to her outside of when I literally had to. I decided to search why this happens, and it turns out that some characters are more likely to be selected for this role, and if multiple people have the highest affinity, the first that appears in an internal game list is chosen. This is so poorly thought out that if you were to care about this bit, unlike me, you'd be very disappointed. This is part of what I believe to be a rather tenuous relationship between developers and attention to detail. Part 6, Attention to Deep, nah, just kidding. Part 6, Story and Side Quests. So the story concept is very fantasy, which I love, you have to get back your heart from a dragon. In reality, it's weird. The first part puts you in front of the action in a way that is really unconvincing and not particularly rewarding. In the first 10 minutes, you fight a Cyclops and then a Hydra, which pacing-wise is really fast and overwhelming on top of also being unconvincing. You're treated as this amazing hero despite the Cyclops being already damaged and also being joined by other soldiers in both fights. It's like the game is desperate to sell you some sort of champion but you just started playing and got pretty heavily carried. And then for the rest of the story you do things that don't feel like main quests, they don't really advance the main plot. You have to find a stolen ring, hunt a griffin, translate some tablet. Only at the end the dragon appears again just to be like, uh, by the way this is the bit where we return to the actual story. Now I will say that in a way it does make some sense, the duke is, remember, a fraud. Of course he'd keep you preoccupied with tasks that don't really matter. Matter. But it not only makes for an interesting storytelling, the Duke also contradicts his actions. In the end, he gives you a lot of resources and the best cape in the base game to fight the dragon. This is the lack of detail I'm talking about, and also a lack of vision. The story could have been far more interesting and intricate if you were to find out that the Duke tries to sabotage you and would actually go somewhere with that idea. I also found myself frustrated at the amount of ambiguity sprinkled throughout the story. Like, you meet three characters that are arisen like you, and at no point do you get any clarification about what's happening. Why did the dragon take your heart? Why does he need to? What is actually going on? All these characters that are important by the sole virtue of being arisen say nothing. It's why I feel that the world of Dragon's Dogma is so shallow. The world building is barely there, interactions are minimal, and the story sounds cool in concept but ends up being a pile of go-girl give us nothing. The side quests don't do much better, but I am willing to be more forgiving, because of course they are outdated in a game this old, and they actually do some interesting stuff every now and then, like pawns acting in specific ways to help you, quests that can end in different ways, and some unique mechanics, like feeding a pet monster. They are okay, except for the part where I have some problems. So one of the things about having multiple ways to do a quest is that I expect different consequences. There's this quest where you have to prove the guilt or innocence of Forneval. Now yes, this is a main quest, but it's a good example of what I expect. In a previous side quest you find out that he's a pretty shrewd landlord, so that's not earning him any points from me. And you can actually get the testimony of the tenants he's kicked to use against him, so that's a cool way quests interact as well. But this is a great moral dilemma. You have a character that you are likely to to dislike and evidence also shows that he's involved in some shady dealings. In fact, if you do nothing, he's automatically found guilty, though you do have a reason to help him because he sells some pretty rare stuff. Great! Then we go to a side quest where you have to retrieve a parcel with proof of treachery, and you can do this in one of three ways. You can give this proof to the duke's men, to someone who is part of the guilty party, or even make a forgery of the proof and give it to both. This is cool, but what does it actually change? That's right, absolutely nothing! This is emblematic of a lack of vision this game has, and also situational attention to detail actually. You can use the same forgery feature to return a fake ring to the duke and when he's supposed to give you his cape, the chest doesn't open because of it. See what I mean? This is attention to detail and honestly a pretty neat interaction. But then you have stuff like Julian asking to be escorted to the border of Grancis while he's supposedly jailed. You can even find him still in jail after you escorted him out. Absolute nonsense. 
Then, the other thing that I didn't like is actually related to this main quest where you have to hunt a griffin. If you happen to do a quest where you retrieve a magical grimoire for someone, they will actually show up and help you. And here's where I thought that completing these side quests might actually have some stuff happen in your main adventure. Sort of followed New Vegas Hoover Dam style. Welp, nope, nothing as significant as this ever happens, which is so strange. Why does this absolutely unremarkable side quest get to shine while nothing else does? It's all just just really disappointing. But let's get to what happens at the end of the game, because this, this, I really didn't like. So, you defeat the dragon, but that's not the end, because Grand Soren starts gaping. Yes, that's what the game says. Now, I didn't see this bit coming, and I like it when my expectations are subverted via an entirely new chapter. So, you do your thing, get loads of wake stones, and then jump to meet God. No, really, you actually meet God. This is the Seneschal, a being who controls life and destruction over the world, and you have to challenge them to take their place in quite possibly the most anticlimactic boss fight in this game. Seriously, you go from the hard fights against massive and imposing enemies, especially the ones from the Dark Arisen expansion, which were f***ing hard, to a fight where I had to put effort into losing to get a trophy for the alternate ending. This is bad. It's really bad. And look, I know that shit boss fights are kind of like a staple now in video games for whatever reason. Uh, I guess we just don't deserve nice things. But what I've absolutely disliked is how this is the sort of twist that makes everything make sense in a way that is thoroughly unsatisfying. Essentially, everything in the world is designed specifically for an Arisen to reach the essential and take their place. So if you ever wondered why the dragon gives you a choice to sacrifice your beloved and go back to sleep, going against his purpose of destruction for seemingly no reason, here's your answer. It's designed this way by the Seneschal. It's not meant to make sense outside of being a test for the Arisen sense of bravery and duty. And you could say that about pretty much anything. Why do pawns exist? Well, the Seneschal. Why does the dragon choose some random fisherman as the Arisen? Well, the Seneschal. Why did no one else have the creativity to create a better process of selecting the next Seneschal? Well, you guessed it, the Seneschal. You get the idea. It explains everything alright, but it just sucks any and all enjoyment out of it. Because the justification is, well, God. The world is not driven by complex factors and motivations, it just works this way because the Seneschal. In fact, the conversation you can have with them at the end feels a lot like philosophical drivel meant to convince you that this ending is actually good, but it just makes the world of Dragon's Dogma somehow feel emptier, lacking in meaning, significance, and even just really dead. And would you believe me when I say that the Seneschal has an answer for that too? Yeah, of course, the answer as to why the world is so dead is the f***ing Seneschal. So you defeat them, take their place, and kind of just wander aimlessly as an intangible thing throughout Casardis and Grand Soren. You can see why the Seneschal was so desperate for someone to replace them. It's boring as shit. The most impactful thing you can do is just grab people, which was a mistake. <coughs> So the only thing you can really do is use the Godsbane Sword and get the ending, and from there you can go into New Game Plus. Oh, right, you actually only have one save file, so if you ever make a mistake, that's too bad. Final part, Dark Arisen. Dark Arisen as an expansion is really kind of interesting. It goes for a very different style of gameplay, from open world exploration to an arcadey sort of concept where you push as far as you can and return with random pieces of equipment you must purify to use. Story-wise, it's in part weird and good. Weird because timeline-wise, there's no real ideal time to play this. The expansion spoils the entire idea of the Seneschal before you meet them, so you'd think you should tackle it after the main story, but you can't really continue after that. But what I like is that there's an actual story story this time around, even though it's mostly exposition. The writers couldn't just send a shoulder way out of this. It's essentially about an arisen, Greta, who quite unusually had a human companion, Ash. She ultimately failed besting the Seneschal and got turned into a dragon herself, thus becoming part of the cycle. As a dragon, Greta decides to make Ash into an arisen, but he finds out that the dragon is Greta and understands the cruel cycle. Thus, he wishes for the power to break the cycle, becoming a demon and taking lordship over the Brittle Black Isle. So now he fights against the eternal cycle by luring over arisen from different worlds. It's also great to see pieces that correct the dragons themselves as Greta still remembers her old life, even having the capability to choose Ash as her arisen, lamenting the cycle yet being bound by it all the same. Ulra is also a pawn who assumed the form of Greta because of the bestowal of spirit, being part of the plan of luring arisen to Bitter Black Isle, albeit thinking her intentions pure. 
I feel like this is honestly more than the base game even tries. Even the place itself actually has some semblance of an identity. Since the theme of the island is madness, you keep advancing deeper and deeper, going through the same holes while getting progressively twisted, darker and more dangerous. Insanity is, after all, doing the same thing over and over, hoping for something different. Huh, who knew this guy would still be relevant more than a decade later? And then you get at the end, have the toughest boss fight of the entire game, get some random rewards, and then you can do it all again, but the final boss gets a new phase that honestly looks f***ing terrifying, and is also even harder despite this boss being genuinely the hardest thing already. But the end this time around is a bit more mysterious since Ash has already been freed, and yet, somehow, it seems like this evil presence persists, possibly using pawns to maintain its form. It's not a plot that necessarily goes anywhere from here, but hey, I'm happy that the answer just isn't the f***ing Seneschal. Anyway, the real problem I have with this expansion is more gameplay related. I mentioned a few parts ago how at some point this expansion gets difficult very fast, not necessarily at the start but at some point in the room with a scripted Shadow Dragon. I am hesitant to say that this is just a balancing thing where enemies get caked up in health and damage, because the thing about this expansion is that it changes the formula of the game quite a lot. In becoming more of an arcade experience, it also changes completely how you get items. Rather than have items be placed in a calculated manner around the map, they're instead randomized. You don't know what you'll get till you purify these things. And if that's not enough, you also have three new levels of weapon enhancements and rings that now improve skills. This is a lot of stuff that changes the balance of the game. It becomes hard to tell at any point how you compare to the content of the expansion and what you should try to improve. And the gap between you and difficulty only grows as you go further and become more confused. Or maybe you just don't find the gameplay loop of grinding rift shards and random items to your liking. It is a really big change in gameplay and I think it's fair to be turned off by it. I didn't like it and I wasn't that keen in trying to find strategies for grinding it out. Luckily for me though, a lot of this stuff is actually pretty poorly designed. You can cheese enemies by staying in places out of their reach or by exploiting their pathing. In fact, pretty much every boss, maybe except for the final one, can be cheesed in one way or another. Even death, a boss that is meant to be the scariest thing ever can just be cheesed over and over again. And he dies from falling. F***ing falling. It's actually how I reached max level in about an hour. And even at max level, things didn't become any easier. I do not think that overall this huge change in gameplay was particularly well done or communicated, and it did come at a point where I found myself frustrated with the Sorcerer vocation as well, through no fault of its own, of course, but it didn't help with my enjoyment of the game. Conclusion I am actually quite disappointed with the fact that I didn't really enjoy Dragon's Dogma as much as I wish I would, because when I look at it, I understand why it's a cult classic. There are some really neat things this game does. The magic, the pawn system, being able to climb enemies, and some small neat interactions. But in the end, there is a lot of bad stuff here, starting with the story and ending with it being awful because the Seneschal... Sorry, I just had to do it one more time. But jokes aside, the world of Dragon's Dogma has no identity, its thousands of characters have no personality, lots of stuff lack vision and suffer from selective attention to detail or just old-fashioned short-sightedness. I am not surprised that there is hype around Dragon's Dogma 2, because in many ways I can see how this game could have been much better. In fact, a huge problem was the limited budget not allowing the development team to deliver on a vision they desired, and that vision was quite grand. In GDC's video behind the scenes of Dragon's Dogma, Hideaki Itsuno discusses how the world was supposed to be twice as big, you could travel through parallel universes, have different races, better relationships through questing, and even consequences for if and how you complete them. But in the end, the budget was just not there, it was their first time making and publishing this sort of game. In fact, Hideaki even mentions how frustrating it was to explain the concept of this game. His co-workers were just not familiar with games from the same genre because they were released in the West, and Capcom didn't really seem to have a lot of faith in it. Most of these concepts are there, but at the end of the day, you should put a barely before there. There are quests that do impact relationships, and sometimes consequences that affect other quests. 
as well as the idea of parallel worlds through the Everfall. But at the end of the day, a budget is just a number, what you do with it is very different. You need to be able to scale back and focus on the smaller experience that you have. I did not need Grancis to be twice as big, I needed it to have an identity. I did not need different races, I needed characters with actual personalities. This is why I don't think the budget was inherently the problem as much as having a better vision of what they would do with their world. Some studios see the budget as a hard limit, while others see it as a challenge, a constraint to push against with smart design and creativity. Sadly, Dragon's Dogma is not part of the latter, and I'll be honest, to some extent I do feel bad for being this negative about the game. It does represent something that I like. Taking a chance on a new IP and a type of game previously not tackled by the studio, something that shakes up the staleness of the game industry. I genuinely hope that Dragon's Dogma 2 realizes its vision and delivers on the many critiques people have had throughout the years. I can easily see this game being a highlight and I'm really looking forward to playing it. In closing, Hideaki mentions how he believes that putting your idea out there and actively engaging in discussions feels rewarding. This was the base idea of the pawn system and it's something that resonates with me. Despite having an insignificantly small following, I do enjoy having my small corner where I can talk about these things. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, like and subscribe if you did, and well, the next video will be on Dragon's Dogma 2, so see you soon.